Good evening. This is the February 23rd meeting of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. We'll call the meeting to order at 7.08 p.m. And first order of business, I'm going to introduce two new members of the committee. Uh, right here on my left is Lisa Norman. Welcome. And at the far end is Bob Burns. So we'll go back over to Patrick and introduce ourselves. And when we land on Lisa and Bob, you have to tell us a little bit about yourself. And, yeah. You know, not five, five or ten minutes will be plenty. Okay, start down here. Uh, Patrick Sweeney. Uh, I didn't want to cop. I'm Lisa Norman. I am employed with the Oregon City School District. I work for Oregon City Community Education Programs and Services, and this is my second term serving on the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. I did so several years ago, and I'm happy to be back. Welcome back. Thank you. Glad to have you. I'm Mike Mitchell. Don Smith. Lynn Betteridge. <laughs> My turn. <Yep. laughs> uh, I had to write your names down because I can't see your nameplate sitting behind them. <laughs> if I were out there, I'd, I wouldn't have to do that. I'm Bob Burns. I've uh, lived in Oregon City for about 45 years. Uh, three children go through the Oregon City school system. Uh, my wife... Uh, was a teacher here in the system for a while, uh, but when our latest child came along, she uh, retired. And uh, I worked for the Oregon Department of Education my last job. Uh, we moved to Oregon City when I was the superintendent for the Clackamas Education Service District in the 1970s, I guess it was, middle 70s to the early 80s. About nine years I spent there. And I retired uh, from the Oregon Department of Education in uh, 1998 and have done a little contracting since that time. And I was looking for something to do where I might, first of all, I had to be interested in it and I might be able to devote, uh, will be able to devote some time and hopefully uh, productive time. And that's my five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Welcome. Glad to have you both here. Okay, next, uh, approval of minutes. Did everybody have a chance to look at minutes from the last meeting? Are there any corrections or additions? No? Would you like to move to approve? I so move. I second. Okay. Moved and seconded to approve the minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Cruising right along. Item number four, citizen comments on issues and items not on the agenda. There don't seem to be any citizens <coughs> present, so we'll move right on past that one to general business. And the first item is the dog park. And uh, honestly, I, don't, I, I have only one small thing to report. It's not a small thing. I have one thing to report. Uh, and that is, uh, in her interview, Lisa had mentioned an interest in an off-leash dog park. And I emailed her a couple of days ago and recruited her for our subcommittee. And she graciously accepted. So uh, Patrick and Lynn and I will work together on that. And uh, I'm hoping maybe, Scott, after the meeting, maybe we could, the four of us, look at our calendars a little bit and try to hit a, a, a time maybe in the next week or so, uh, get Lisa up to speed, figure out where we go next, and, and try to get this thing moving forward. As the weather's starting to get a little better, I'm sure it's going to get back on some people's radar. So we want to. Hopefully, be able to get some. So maybe we can touch base on a calendar. Uh, I don't have anything to add to that unless anybody else has anything in dog park. Uh, just one thing, Mike, if I could. The, the last meeting you gave out that, that um, criteria for evaluating dogs or dog park sites, mm -hmm. right. and you, I, I think you just asked everybody for their input or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I passed out a, a paper copy of that at your places there, just as a reminder to everyone. So I didn't know if you wanted to do anything else with that. Um, or if you just want to kind of let folks have that and think about it or whatever. If anybody has any suggestions for things that I haven't thought of, I'm sure there are some things. That's That was kind of the point of passing that out, was just to make sure that we think of all the different criteria that we need to, that we need to consider. So if there's any input on that, you could email me about that or, or bring it up later on in the meeting or whatever. So. Okay, Veterans Fee Waiver for Dog Park. And I see we have a handout about that, and maybe, Scott, you can give us the high points of that. I yeah. assume that's what you were thinking. Correct. Um, so as, as a reminder to the uh, 
to the committee members and also kind of as a background for the two new members to let you know what this is about. Um, a few meetings ago, a couple of representatives from our, our city's um, Citizen Involvement Council, which is the sort of the overreaching organization that represents all the neighborhoods for the city. Um, made a request to the Parks and Rec Committee that they would, that you and that the Parks Department would consider a um, instituting a policy where we would um, <coughs> waive the RV park fees that are charged for um, for veterans. And they specifically referenced that the state parks has a policy in their campgrounds for that uh, for that type of <coughs> fee waiver. We brought this back up at your last meeting, and uh, there seemed to be enough interest from the committee here for us to go back and do a little bit more follow-up, and, and you asked if we could bring you back some additional info. Um, there are a couple of handouts that I gave you. Just basically, these are just print-offs from the State Parks website and also the county website. Um, again, the what was kind of referenced in this whole recommendation by the, the Citizens Involvement Council <coughs> was uh, referenced back to the state parks policy. And that's um, spelled out in that, in that one handout that's the state parks one. Um, we also found Clackamas County in uh, their park system. They have, I think they have three parks that has uh, camping or RV parking uh, for overnight use. And they, as of this last year in 2011, have also adopted a similar policy. And basically what they did, you'll see in that, um, the one that says Clackamas County on the front page. of lost revenue whenever you do something like this. So whether that's the RV 
be part, whether we waive any kind of registration fee with the program or what have you. Um, there's, al there's always a cost to the city to collect that revenue, or it might be taking up a space that somebody else would otherwise be using. And so um, one of the questions that was brought up actually at our, at our meeting last time was, uh, is there any way we can find out or estimate what that would be? We really don't have any way to, to estimate how many how many people would use this program to be in place. But what we did do was uh, we just kind of did an informal survey. We asked the county and we asked the state parks folks approximately what their wave revenue is per year. Um, the county just started this program and their comment was something to the effect of we don't know that the word's out that much yet, so it's hard to know if people are really utilizing it very mm -hmm. much, so it's not a very good indicator because it's the first year. Uh, and they estimated that they discounted uh, in the neighborhood about $1,200 so for all three of their county parks. So again, we probably out there doing the best implemented, the best discount, so we're just mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. State Parks has been doing this for a while, and of course, they've got like 26 parks that this is applicable to. And, um, this isn't a very good comparison, and I'm not sure how we would figure out whether, but I, I think the point is it, it's probably pretty well utilized. Um, the State Parks, um, it, the number that we got was it's about a half a million dollars a year in lost wave, lost, lost revenue, or, or wave revenue, mm -hmm. or however you want to call that. But again, that's, that's on a much, much bigger scale, so it's, yeah, not yeah. Very, it's not very relative or it's not very easily comparable. So that's really all we can give you for <coughs> kind of comparative information. But just, I guess the point there is that there is um, there's a value in doing it, but there's also, there's also a cost in doing it. Now, our RV part right now isn't full most of the time. It's, it's rarely at 100% occupancy. It might be on a summer weekend, a particularly busy or a holiday weekend, it might be full. Most of the time, we're not at 100% occupancy. So it's unlikely at the current time that you would have somebody using one of these waivers that would actually be displacing a fee paying person. Um, we are talking about, and it's, it's um, something that uh, it's on the goals we'll be talking about in a little bit in terms of our process. We're looking at hopefully improving our RV part, um, and then it might be more of an issue at, at some point. So that's kind of all the information that I've got for you, and, and would like to hear from you about what your, your thoughts are or what your uh, feel strongly to support this or want to go in a different direction. Um, my recommendation would be that we, I think, we take a look at it. Um, <coughs> it's got more benefit than, than, than the lost, potential lost revenue. Um, but I'm certainly open to your, your thoughts on that. That's a question. What is our estimated annual revenue from our park? Uh, do you have that we do. number uh, close? I don't have the exact <coughs> in front of me, but it's, it ranges between um, about fifty and $60,000 a year. Mm. Substantial. Uh, a little bit higher and a little bit lower in some years. Does that include the dump fee? It does not. That's in a separate, that's accounted for separately. That's about, yeah, it's, it's, that's a donation. Um, I think we raised between 1500 and 2000 a year on donations for that. Somewhere in that ballpark. So would you, you think that that would, that this kind of program would waive the dump fee for the vets? Or a request well, of a donation? Well, it's just a requested donation anyway. So, uh -huh. uh, are you saying people would be inclined not to donate? Or I'm not sure I understand the question. It, it, the way it works is you you pull up. We have a, a separate RV waste dump station <coughs> at Park. It's kind of near the, the RV park, and it's it's there basically as for two reasons. One, it's for users of the park because we don't have we don't have um, dump stations within the RV park sites uh, for, for a number of reasons. So it's for the people who are actually using the RV park, but it's also just as kind of a community of public service and a, a health thing as, as folks can, can empty their, their waste out of their RVs. And we just ask for a donation. Uh, it just 
there's there's a lockbox and it says you know if you'd like to donate it. and and all the all the funds that are collected from that go back into some form of, of improvement to the RV park. So we use them for some projects here. And there. So I think that, I'm not yeah, there's some context back there that we kind of talked about in other conversations that um, I think I was thinking of when I mentioned that and. I guess to make it simple, um, I'd like to see that dump station set up in a way that we weren't hoping for a donation that it actually cost you to get through there. Mm -hmm. And I have a kind of a, an interest in the RV park too, so yeah. um, mm -hmm. meaning I'm on the trying to help with the development of it, um, and I think that the. When it's just a voluntary donation that creates some anxiety among those waiting in line that didn't pay and those that did pay and I think I would like to see a uniform application there of whatever the rule is going to be or see a rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now we don't and that's something that we can talk about. Um, one consideration with that is, is our ability to administer with, our, with the RV part. We do have a way to check the seats. Um, a little bit of an antiquated system is basically based on the ability of the staff and we have volunteer park folks, as I think most of you know. Um, and our staff check the receipts on weekdays, and then the volunteers kind of keep tabs of who's paying and who's not. But the, the way station is separated a little bit, and frankly, right now, there's, no real, there's really no way to monitor that. Um, I mean, we could say it costs you X amount and either you pay or don't pay, but at least there'd be an ask for a fee, but um, it, it'd be a little bit, that'd be a little bit tricky to figure out how to administer that type of policy. <coughs> well, I think it would take um, investment in infrastructure, but I'm not here to try to add work to a staff that really a third of them aren't here, any, you don't have the budget for it. <coughs> um, but I, I think that um, in the dreaming forward, that um, there's a lot of money being that could be made on that dump station that I think I know I watched it it's it's not I would bet maybe a fifth of the people who even put money in the thing at the most I'm not sure about that that may be the case one, one thing um, you know and I, I think that's a valid point uh, one thing we could consider and I was going to talk about this a little bit when we go through our goals okay I have kind of a status report in the RV part Goals. One of those that um, we're going to be doing our um, our master plan, kind of our final design, and as part of that, that might be a consideration. Don, I'm sure you're going to probably be involved in, you know, have your hands on that in some level. If you're interested in that, you've expressed that. Um, that might be something that we consider in terms of the design of the park and how we might streamline the administration of that or make some recommendations about the fees because certainly the one of the things one of the hopes is that one we're going to make that a much nicer place for our own community it's, it's in a very visible location we're going to make it nicer for visitors and hopefully increase our revenue uh, making ability there by making it nicer so that ties into that part of the discussion so my recommendation is that we kind of try to tie that together with mm -hmm. whatever the, the planning effort is there I just wanted to quickly mention a couple of things that I noticed in the document from Clackamas County. And one of them is that they're saying specifically that the camping fee is waived 100%, but the transaction <coughs> fee of the site is still applicable. And so it would seem that as the new system is set in place that there may be a way of defining those two charges. The other thing, it's kind of interesting because, of course, Clackamas County is a much larger system and has a lot more parks that include camping facilities, um, but it talks about ADA facilities being a part of that particular location. And so um, I'm sure the adjoining Clackamas Park is ADA, I'm quite sure that would be ADA um, uh, certified, but um, maybe as the plans go on with the development of the RV park, 
you know, that, that will help to define it as well. How much of a resource, it, how much of an investment, you know, and how much of a maintenance issue it is. Just a couple of little thoughts. <coughs> We do end up adopting a, a policy like this, you know, we kind of basically adopt what the state's current policy is. Um, what the clock in this, that thing about the, what do they call it, a service charge or a surcharge? Or whatever it is. We don't, we don't have that be in place right now. We don't have any such thing. I think that's for the staff <coughs> time involved in making the reservations and whatnot. Mm -hmm. In our property park, it's, it's very low tech at the moment. Maybe at some point it's going to make improvements. how we do registrations, but it's first come, first serve, and just it's a manual drop off. So there wouldn't be, at the current time, there wouldn't be any issue about waiving or not waiving the transaction fee because we don't charge them. The, mm -hmm. the fee is the fee, and that's all of this. We, we um, <coughs> and then there is some language about some ADA <coughs> handicap stuff, uh, disabled veterans, and, and different things like that as well. I don't know if that's what you're well, uh, yeah, this is, is, is part of the policy as well. Right, right. So I wonder if anybody's ever thought of, um, uh, maybe, I, I wonder if the state and the county both use the same processor um, when you do the online reservation, and if we could jump on that. I'm not sure. I mean, I could find, I'm going to ask, I could even ask, find out if about you it. Want to, yeah. Uh, Okay. Sure. You could <coughs> put your to-do list away, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Reduce it. <laughs> I know the state is uh, ReserveAmerica.com, mm -hmm. and it's a outside contractor. You can reserve in all over the country on it. I don't know what the county does. Um, a couple of thoughts on this. I, I think this is a great idea for us to do it. When I look at the state one, and then especially the county one, it, there's, I mean, there, there's all kinds of different ways to prove, and there's ways to get a, re a refund if you don't remember your card. And I guess I kind of mm -hmm. hate to see us go down all that road because now you're adding a bunch of administration. But if you have your special access pass or a license. disabled veterans license plate, right. you're good to go. Other than that, bring your pass next time. I, and I think if we do something more along those lines, it's still a, it's still a nice benefit. It's a reasonable policy, and it's not going to put an administrative burden on somebody to mail out refund checks and yeah. all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, I, I had that same thought, and I appreciate you making that observation, Mike, because I, that would have been part of my recommendation at the end of bringing forward a, a policy for for actual implementation. <laughs> we have to look at those kind of issues for the time being. else on this subject where do, where do we go next well if it's if it's of interest to the to the um, committee and uh, <coughs> I think staff is supportive of continuing to explore what we'd probably come up with next is some language <coughs> for our own policy to talk about some of the things for example what you're saying what we we would reference probably the state parks uh, policy then include some of our own local things like we wouldn't probably get into you know, refunds without because you know our ability to administer amplify it and mm -hmm. the discussion about things like the administrative fee or whatever it is that the county charges we don't have that so we <coughs> so we we come back with some language that would be a, like a draft policy basically <coughs> presented to the parks committee ask you to take a look at it and we could talk about it until until we get to a point where we're comfortable with with a recommendation. And then that policy, most likely, that would have to be something that's going to be approved by our city commission. Um, and uh, probably a good time to do that, to implement a policy, is at the beginning of a fiscal budget year, which is July 1st. So the way we're tracking right now, we actually <coughs> have a time on to do that. If I bring back something at the next meeting and it's agreeable, or if not, we have another crack meeting, and then I would be able to get it on a city commission agenda and potentially implement it by July 1st if that's what we're going to do. And then and then it's getting the word out. 
that'll kind of happen. If that sounds acceptable, we can go that way. Right. Very good. I see mostly head nods, so yeah, yes. that sounds good. To <laughs> bring the draft something next time. Okay. <coughs> On to pocket parks. Pocket parks. So, <coughs> what do we want to do? <laughs> um, first, we want to give any kind of a review for our new members, <coughs> or we want to get that far into it. Um, at the last what? meeting, we talked a little bit about some of the maintenance uh, costs, and we reviewed those. Uh, for any of you that weren't here, I could provide you that information. That there might be a couple of you that weren't at the meeting, plus the two new members. I know you were gone, and Patrick, you might have been gone as well. Anyway, we looked at we looked at actual uh, maintenance estimates for the for these sites over the cost of or over the course of a year, and I think we came up with a number that was probably around ten thousand dollars a year for maintaining these sites. And, whether that was a number, a number that was significant enough to go through the challenge of trying to figure out what to do with these sites or not. Um, again, the discussion about maybe taking it to the individual neighborhoods and <coughs> asking if they'd be interested in adopting that park or doing something. Somebody even suggested uh, neighborhood gardening sites, you know, public gardens or those right. community gardens. Community so, garden. Uh, that came up, so I kind of left there. it there, but. Um, my, I think at this point, my sense though is that, um, you know, unless there's a strong, unless there's a real strong push from the Parks Committee, I don't feel as compelled as when we sort of first started talking about this a while ago. Um, I feel like, you know, there's some of those properties we even looked at and said, I don't think we could even give these away. And, much less do they have any value to sell. There are probably a couple of them that do have some value. Some of them are just um, parcels behind somebody's house on a hillside or something like that that basically have you know, almost no or minimal value. Um, but like I said, there probably could be a couple of sites that, that might actually have some value where somebody, a private party or a developer, somebody may be interested in taking that off the city's hands. If <coughs> what we're talking about for those new members um, probably getting the gist of the conversation. We have some, some parcels that have very limited use by our, um, we probably were talking about this when we were the <laughs> So it's been really? a discussion yeah. for a long time. Uh, we have some properties <coughs> that mm -hmm. really have very, very limited park or recreational use that um, potentially we, we'd like to maybe consider getting rid of. There was a ballot measure um, over 10 years ago that was put in the community to ask to get rid of some parcels. It was rejected in a, at a very high percentage. The community said, no, keep the parks. We don't, and, and I think there's just a stigma about getting rid of parks, and maybe it, part of it is just in the message or whatever, but um, uh, there's, a, um, there's a provision in our city charter that says you cannot, you cannot lease or sell or otherwise get rid of any park land without a, a vote of the people. So that's what we're talking about is we'd have to put, we'd have to define which properties and put, actually put them on the, ba the ballot and specifically ask the, the voters of this community, can we sell or dispose of these properties? And it's a little tricky to do that because it sounds funny to ask, can we get rid of parks? You know, there's a lot of background to why we'd want to do that. You know, there'd, there'd be a lot of education. So. Anyway, um, I don't know how the the rest of the committee's feeling, and we've got some new members, we've got a few others that have been pretty involved in this discussion that aren't here tonight. Um, I'm not quite sure where we go with this at this point. So. Wasn't there some success with homeowners associations taking over a couple smaller parks? I'm thinking of one out Glen Echo area. Uh, Glen, Glen Oak neighborhood. Yes, well, there you go. Not, Glen Oak. not quite like that. Oh, I'm okay. on the right track, though. Um, but <coughs> those were properties that were already privately owned. Homeowners Association property. Oh, okay. No, and they no. wanted us to take them over. Yeah. You guys. Other way around. <laughs> <laughs> there are some um, there. Actually, that one has turned into a little bit of a success story because they, uh, I think when you were on the committee, if I'm not mistaken, they came to the, to the city and said, would you take this 
the, you know, the developer made this part of our development and the homeowner association was put was put it with the bills of maintaining or the insurance liability or what to do. Mm -hmm. they, at this particular site of, off of Glen Oak Road, they put in a really low level play set. It was actually built in somebody's backyard, <laughs> not, a, not a commercial playground. <laughs> <laughs> it just got destroyed. And my neighbor came and said, Can you take this property and make it into a park? And it, it, it was so small. We're already talking about not keeping these pocket parks, and it was definitely a pocket park. And we, we were looking at buying the property on Glen Oak Road that we've now purchased about nine acres. And that, you know, we had a bigger goal in mind versus a little one acre parcel that didn't serve a lot of purpose. So we had to kind of say, No, thank you. Um, they actually got a city uh, metro enhancement to nice. refurbish that playground area and have made it a nicer park. So it's nice. It kind of turned out okay. I think we still love to see us build a, a bigger park across the street, which we're, we're working on. So. A question? Does anybody have the history of these pocket parks? I mean, how did we uh, come to uh, have these? We're the oldest city in the Beginning of our city time. And okay. Nothing recent. Uh, nothing. Well, some of them are some of them are sort of in the modern history, but a, a lot. Of it. We have um, we have a total of forty eight ish properties that are either parks or open space or natural space, and there's a whole variety of ways how they come into okay. being in city ownership, and they all have a little different story. Some of them are were very intentional when you set out and actually try to purchase a park and build it. And, and then there's these little odds and ends pieces that somewhere along the way somebody gave to the city because they didn't want it or they, it's a tax write-off or they somebody just sort of gave, you know, abandoned. There, there's all these different ways that it, they come to be. These, these smaller parcels typically, you know, if we could go back 100 years, we'd probably go, don't, don't take that down. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a bad idea, but <coughs> there's things like that that just happen over time. So at the risk of, I probably asked this question, but I forgot the answer. Where did this item come from on the Pratt goals? Where, whose dream is this to deal with this? Uh, Brian Watt, I think, brought it up first. Well, didn't he? Or maybe not. In, in fairness, uh, yeah, what I would say. But I'm not blaming anybody. I, no, <laughs> yeah. I'm getting ready to. No. <laughs> <laughs> Before we start, Brian says he's saying no. Um, no, I know Brian has been a supporter of exploring this for sure. So that, that is correct. But it, this conversation goes back uh, to the early 2000s when the city attempted to to sell or dispose of some of these parks. So it goes back before any of us were involved in <coughs> way before I was the director here and certainly before any of you were involved. So the conversation really started probably 15 years ago or more. It went through one iteration where it got shot down and, and then we had to kind of, you know, let it be for a while. And it, over different uh, times with different staff or different uh, people on the Parks Committee, it's been talked about in a lot of different ways and a lot of different times. And I'm, At this point, it's um, not really sure who, who exactly owns it or whatever, but Brian was a proponent of exploring it. Exploring getting rid of them? Mm -hmm. Or exploring well, Okay. With all due respect to Brian and whoever else was involved in this conversation, um, we're volunteers with only so much time. And if we've been talking about this for 15 years and we're only as far as we are, I move that we delete that from the list <coughs> and work on lower hanging fruit. Well, I would like to see if there are pieces that are kind of costing us to maintain that don't have a whole lot of use or value. There are some organizations in the community like Harvest 2020 and the Singer Hill Growers who may be interested in using those as farm, you know, growing sites. We have one up at Eastham that they take care of and they maintain. There's another little triangle piece over on Division that they maintain and take care of. And I mean, it's, it's for community use and it's for the benefit of everyone in the community. And if we could get them interested in that, I think that would be a great and I think use well, of that space. I think one of the reasons why it's still being discussed and 
on our plate is because of the cost. What's the grand total again? Ten grand. Ten grand. Ten grand, Ten grand per year. For uh, all of the parts. Right. So ten grand per year for <coughs> since it's been discussed for the last ten years. So I guess it, you know, maybe that's the reason why it keeps coming up, or that's on, you know, why it's on our list. I want to throw out an idea too, because I'm kind of a visual learner. And two summers ago, the new, with the, with the PRAC members were invited to go on a bus ride and looked at probably eight or ten Boy, sites, yeah. and there were some obvious like comments, <laughs> reactions. Yeah. I'm thinking specifically of the park that's nothing but really ugly concrete just downhill from the swimming pool. And uh, it was a, originally, I think, a high dive site, and it was a, an old pool when I was like in high school. So it's like, huh? You know, is that a liability? <laughs> mm -hmm. Is it something we're really proud of? Do we question that? But that's not necessarily to say, hey, we need to sell it. It's more to say, um, if we see these things that are so obviously amiss, should we? Um There's a little button on the back of this little light. I think I think I just figured it out. <laughs> it's going to be wrong. It's going to be wrong. It's that it was initially set up for staff and students but also later expanded to the community and there are two large lots um, they are rented by the calendar year uh, you have to re-rent them and they're like a 20 by 20 uh, piece for $40 a year and they provide the water but you provide the hose and obviously some are much better established than others and people have put obviously more than one lot together you know when you go buy them but that's it, it says to me that um, we that's available to the community that if people really want to get into the dirt and grow some stuff <coughs> that that's something that's pretty much available so there. go ahead oh just uh, uh I guess uh, to to Don and Lisa's points, um, I think one thing to keep in mind: we can what we're talking about is the the disposition or the disposal, the ability to to try to ask the voters if we can get rid of these sites or not. That's sort of the big question. Um, and what you're suggesting, Lisa, that you know, there might be some uses for these unused sites that we're not thinking of, um, some program ideas, which is you know I we when we have new folks with new ideas come along and that's great that those we can keep those two issues separated because the one is the the big question and what Don I think maybe was making a motion about there was basically you know drop the question of even trying to dispose of them but then a separate issue is maybe reprogramming or programming uses of these unused sites uh, there might be some folks out there looking to do some in innovative or interesting things on property that's otherwise underutilized so that those can be I guess the point is just to keep in mind those are two different discussions probably or possibly they can be so I agree I think I was mostly speaking to I remember the discussion about <coughs> what it took to get it to the ballot and right. the, all the language and mm -hmm. that just doesn't even seem doable um, but having other uses for the property that's a great mm -hmm. way to um, I mean you're talking about maintenance costs that's the primary motivator I, mm -hmm. I guess is the 10 grand a year times how many years you guys been talking about this for $150,000 <laughs> worth so far <laughs> um, it, it does seem good though it seems like unless our legal team puts together a way to bring it to the voter to make it you know a doable situation to be sold 
so that it's unloaded and we're not dealing with the costs, then we should stop spinning around. Uh, because we're not the legal team, we can't write that mm -hmm. uh, language. We don't know how to bring it, and you've, you know, it's been told to us now that it has to go to the voter. So the only thing we should spin around is, you know, what we've kind of stewed in a little bit. Lisa's brought up again tonight is that the only thing we should talk about is, you know, a progressive things we could do with the property, <clears throat> something we could do that's beneficial. Otherwise, you're you're probably right, Don. It, shouldn't be talking about it much more. And that's the kind of direction that I'm looking for is do we do we keep putting this back on the agenda for rehashing <coughs> or do we kind of drop that part of it and then, you know, at some point look at those other options or whatever? The reprogramming idea or what have you. Personally I don't think it's worth spending any more time on unless somebody comes along and says, Hey, I would like to get I would like to buy this one or you know, let it let let it bubble up from somebody with a demand for it. Because even if we were trying to put something on the ballot, dispose to who? Right. Most of them have no value, and nobody else is going to want them. So the idea of you know waiting, and you know you would know, as the person that somebody would contact, that this group is interested in disposing those if an opportunity comes along. You know, you have that information all the time if if somebody calls. Plus pursue the idea of some of these other alternative yeah. uses, but to spend any more time or thinking about putting something on the ballot or trying to market these, it's not worth it. Yeah, there's a lot of other priorities that we're trying to get accomplished. A lot of, you know, on the staff side of things here, we've got a whole lot of, whole whole list of things that we can't even get to. So, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm in support of that <coughs> direction if that's where you want to go. I think we've kind of reached that, that point of the the, the discussion on this issue where it's kind of been up and down for, you know, the better part of, I don't know how long we've been talking about it here with the recent iteration, maybe a better part of a year or more. But I think we kind of reached that point where let's go, let's go this way or that way. So my sense is we're going to kind of take this off the priority list for now. And, and then if we want to, you know, make it an uh, agenda item at, to, to take a look at some other uses, if you have some specific proposals or things that you know I'll of, we can... <laughs> bring those forward. You can just bring those to me <coughs> directly. You can bring them up at this meeting if it's something that this group wants to talk about, whatever. So that was that's what I needed was a, a sense of direction on where you want to go. Mm -hmm. So I think I've got that. Okay. So move on to item D, goals update. And everybody should have our 2011 goals with some notes from Scott mm -hmm. on uh, status and progress and so forth. Uh, for Lisa and Bob, this, this document is something that we keep working on all the time, and we try to uh, spend our time on these goals. If something's uh, important, we get it on here. If it's not important, like maybe number nine, which is the pocket park issue, we, we would take it off, and, it, and we modify it. Obviously, it goes along. It's a, it's a living, growing thing. So, Scott, did you want to walk us through your notes, or how do, how do you want to do this? Uh, whatever you prefer, I can I can go through those individually, or or you can you've got the info there. You can talk about specific and ones. I guess the idea is you would um, mind briefly. Yeah, us through it. no, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and what I would suggest we do is this is just you know every so often we'll try to do a, a status update on on your goals. And as you obviously already said that Mike is uh, it says 2011. These were the goals that you established this last year. But these tend to be kind of a rolling list. We take things off, we add things on. Um, so, you know, at whatever point you want to, if you want to, um, well, obviously we just talked about one we're going to delete, but you can also talk about re reordering your prior. I mean, these aren't, ap these aren't necessarily, I don't think, in a priority order unless you want to make it that way. Um, but you can, you can talk about sort of updating these at some point, whether that's tonight or if you want to wait until the folks that couldn't be here tonight could participate, whatever you want to do, but just like to bring that back in front of you every so often so you can kind of keep those keep those fresh. Um, the uh, number one there, uh, Wesleyland Park, um, it, I put in progress where um, uh, the uh, restroom and concession building is nearly complete. Um, that is being done by the uh, Oregon City High School Construction Group, another fantastic project that they've done. Um, we're also in 
that same group is putting in dugouts at, at that park this year. Um, so actually these are some amenities that were part of the what we call the phase two of the park that are being done now because we've had some opportunities to get them done and it looks great. Um, the, the rest of that goal is that we have some uh, undeveloped property at, at West Zealand Park with some of the later added pieces that need to be, we need a vision for what that's going to be in order to really to accomplish that goal to identify funding and and even to seek, you know, opportunities to fund and develop that the rest of the park. We're going to have to do at some point a master plan. Um, a lot of these goals tie together because we can only do so many projects at once. Um, the number four, um, that's going to begin, we're going to begin master planning two vacant properties this year, developing a vision for those parks. Um, so Wesley Lynn Park isn't probably going to be master plan this year. That might be something we'll be able to do in the future. But we are doing parts of phase two. Um, and then there's some of it that we still need to identify what that even means. So it's in progress and some, um, some of that has been accomplished. Uh, number two, we just talked about uh, determining the future plans for the RV park. I put in progress where um, we are in putting together a, an RFP document, a request for proposals that we'd be asking for um, proposals from from design companies, from landscape architects, what have you. Uh, and we're going to engage the services of, of a, a professional designer to help us finish the, the, the full master plan design of that. And that, that's going to be uh, done this spring and summer. So hopefully by the end of this calendar year, we may have a completed master plan. Um, number three, I put not currently in progress. That one kind of need to take a look at. Um, it's we <coughs> Chapin Park is one of our most heavily used parks. Um, definitely needs some improvements. We have we have a master plan uh, for improvements of Chapin Park. Uh, basically, every most most of what is there is the original design of the park. It opened in 1983, and um, the 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 master plan was done probably seven or eight years ago. So it's it's getting a little dusty or. Um, a little possibly antiquated it might even be that we need to take a look at that but we've had this kind of on as a rolling item just because um, there's a master plan document for re re uh, redoing that park making some improvements and we you know we want to keep that in mind um, I'm not sure that that is a, is a priority above several other things on here um, number four the the master plans for the Glen Oak and the Filbert Run properties are two newest purchase properties, uh, basically getting uh, to the point of also hiring uh, a firm to do the, the, the master plan public input design process for those um, over the course of this spring and summer. Uh, so we're making good progress on that. That's it's We're just kind of wrapping some things up and then we're moving on to these other projects. Uh, the dog parks um, in progress. We're going to continue that conversation. Um, I don't know what else we'd want to add to that at this point, but it's definitely in progress. Uh, the naming of trail linkages, standard signage. Um, I put on there, and you, by the way, these are just my own, kind of my own progress notes. You may have different ways you want to describe this, but this is just for discussion purposes anyway. Um, we've completed some portions of this goal uh, with our riverfront trails and our, our downtown uh, wayfinding signage that, that is going in and then of course our signage project on the promenade this last year we've got some more planning and progress for some other trail segments that'll be uh, that'll be signed and, and some of that kind of thing that actually Denise and I are working on so that's kind of an in-progress type of thing and that might need to be defined a little bit more as far as what prax understanding of that goal means but we've certainly been working on a lot of that um, number seven, the end of the Oregon Trail site. I, I reported to you at your last meeting that the the City Commission uh, annual goal setting retreat that had taken place just in January, uh, the, determin the determination was made by the Commission that they would like to discuss this at an upcoming City Commission work session. That'll probably happen here in the next probably two or three months. And uh, what the Commission would like to do is um, basically put out a kind of a call for proposals to 
help the city create a vision of what what the use <coughs> is going to be there. Um, I'll keep you posted on as we move forward in beginning that you know process and and how that's going to play out. But uh, we're definitely the, the commission has definitely set that as as an as one of their goals as well to do. That's that's a private work session. No, it's a public meeting. That'll be public. Yeah, oh yes, definitely. So I'll let you know when that is. Should you be interested in coming or tuning in or yeah, I, I look, I look participating, whatever. No, it's a it's a public okay. city commission work <clears throat> session. Uh, number eight, uh, that's the parks maintenance utility fee, and the Pratt goal was specifically was basically to support being uh, or to be supportive of that um, exploration of a maintenance utility fee. Um, I told you at your last meeting also the commission from from their um, goal setting session that they decided that they wanted to defer um, the exploration of a park utility fee for the time being while they work on some other city priorities uh, that we we and we talked about those pretty extensively last meeting they definitely it's still on the radar the commission is still interested in that but um, it's going to be a little while because they've got some other um, <coughs> issues that they need to address like library public works site and the water rates issue which are all three very significant things and all three that are likely going to have to go to a vote of the people and a lot of public engagement so you can only ask your community for so many things at one time and then number nine we just talked about that one so I kind of put an X on that number nine and then uh, ten is the Singer, Singer Falls project um, it just says it just, the, the goal was support Singer Falls project. Uh, the the first phase was completed last year. That was the a couple of things. One was sort of the cleanup of <coughs> opening up the falls, and uh, and this other part of that was the installation of that new art mural at the bottom on Railroad Avenue, which was done last year. Now Rotary did this project, but Prac was very supportive, and we've had some updates from. From the Rotary folks, and and Prac has been <coughs> pretty pretty supportive of the ongoing efforts there. Um, nothing is definite at this point, but there are some future future phases that are being discussed. For example, the um, the lighting of the falls, um, and and possibly some other things. So uh, there you go. That's the sort of the status on all these, and you know whatever whatever you want to do with these goals to. Kind of refresh them, update them. Uh, if you want to bring them back and kind of really get into them a little bit more at another session or whatever you want to do. Uh, personally, I think we'd be better off to, you know, maybe at our next meeting, dig into these a little deeper, give everybody a chance to, give Lisa and Bob a chance to review them and all the rest of us a chance to refresh ourselves on them mm -hmm. and uh, get into them in more depth. Um, that being said, I can't resist asking a question or two. So, <coughs> Glen Oak, Filbert Run, Wesley Lynn. I gathered from what you said about the Wesley Lynn, the master plan for the undeveloped part would be something that would happen later. You, you're putting that at a lower priority. But when it, when it comes to spending the money, you know, making making development happen, how do, how, is, how do you see or how, how would the priority between Glen Oak and Filbert Run be established? Which one goes first? Well, Really good question, actually. Um, there's a, a, a few different ways of looking at that. One is we always look back to our parks master plan, and we've got the the 08 master plan update. Um, I I believe that what that master plan tells us our highest priority development area is the Glen Oak property. It has been for a long, long time. We um, the because of the that was some of the highest the level of intense residential development in the city that was unserved or underserved by parks uh, or you know was underserved for park services and um, one of the major goals for a long time for PRAC was just to get a piece of property secured in that location that was a goal for for many years um, a few years ago finally we were able to secure a piece of property um, the the Filbert Run property. So, so my, to answer your question directly, I think I think it's the Glen Oak property. Um, the Filbert Run property is uh, not quite as high of a priority simply because 
there are some parks that are not directly in that neighborhood um, and filbert run park is a, is a small neighborhood park um, the glen oak property is more of what you would call like a community park it means it serves both the local neighborhood and probably some broader community uses um, but the filbert run property being a smaller neighborhood park is going to mostly directly just serve the residents there there's not as many residents right there in the in the vicinity of that and there are there are some parks in that part of the city that are um, closer they're served closer than than the folks that are in the Glen Oak neighborhood are uh, for example um, Wesley Lynn Park uh, it, which is a new park newer park Chapin Park they're kind of in that vicinity it's not exactly walkable for the folks in the Filbert Run neighborhood but not as far away as say the folks in the Glen Oak neighborhood have to go where they can have a, a park so um, yeah what we're talking about though just to be clear is just the master planning so that we can develop the, the vision of what the park will be that'll also give us um, the ability to figure out about what the, the price tag is going to be on the park so we can even start to identify the, the funding needs and, and then kind of working forward from there and the reason that, uh, just to clarify as well, what I said about the moving the, the Wesley Lynn future phase master <coughs> plan a little bit down the priority list is simply we've already built uh, the first big phase of that park, and it's kind of like we can say we've got the park in place. We're going to develop it at some point. But these other parks where these communities are underserved, especially Glen Oak, we've got to really put some attention into that. We had. You know, we did Wesley Lynn, and then we kind of focused on the Kanima property this last year, getting that one done, and then we're going to move on. And I, th I really, I really think our our biggest um, park development priority is is that Glen Oak region. Mm -hmm. That may be more in information than you were looking for, but I wanted well, to kind of no, paint the global good. picture for the whole thing. I guess. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Anything else from anybody on goals before we move on? Yeah. Um, the end of Oregon Trail Interpretive Center, it says um, upcoming city commission work session. Um, Any way we can be a fly on the wall or more? Definitely, yeah. It's, it's an, um, as, as I was saying a little bit ago, I, uh, I will keep you informed as to when that gets scheduled. Um, as with any park-related issue, the, the commission will look to you, the advisory committee, for, for input. Um, Sometimes they'll solicit it specifically. Sometimes you'll just need to tell them uh, what you think. Uh, it's a, it, a work session. Don't take that as don't get. It's it's an open public okay. city commission meeting. It's just a little bit more informal. <clears throat> the difference between a regular commission meeting and a work session is they actually make decisions and set policies and take actions in a regular commission meeting. Um, they'll pass ordinances or pass resolutions. They'll award contracts in a regular meeting what have you in a work session they'll define a few items and then basically just gather information about that and sort of talk about where to go with with that you know it's it's tend to be kind of issues that they're not certain about where they're going with it and, and brainstorming that's a great way to describe yeah. it and there are no decisions made in work sessions it's right. just discussion information gathering and discussion so it's in this they take place right here they look just like a regular commission meeting but the the format is a little bit more informal and it's a public meeting so I would I would let you know and if you want to tune in uh, either on the computer or come to the meeting and participate uh, you, you can certainly do that they take questions and stuff like that too. typically especially from one of their committees if you're representing okay. Didn't Ted represent Prack on a yes. little study group? Was that, with this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so you might want to think about that. Mm -hmm. So is that is that group's work out the window and they're starting over, or are they moving on from moving they didn't on get from too that? Far, did they? Yeah. Well, great. Another great question. Um, and I, what I suggest is you probably want to uh, make uh, an appointment for somebody to be your representative to that to that issue specifically so that if there is a commission work session or something like that you could send somebody specifically to make sure they represent you and carry your whatever your um, consensus is on that 
Um, what took place was that that was a, a task force and PRAC was represented on the task force. The task force made a recommendation um, and there's a, a full report that's available and for the new members, I, I, if they're, uh, I, I kind of need to make mental or, or physical notes. Like I, need, I know I need to send that to you, uh, Lisa and Bob, um, just to have this information. Most of this stuff that I'll reference, if there's any kind of report, it's always available on our website and I can help to help you look at that or I can give you physical copies of that. At any rate, the task force recommendation was given to our city commission now over a year ago. So in essence, that, that work was, was done. The task force kind of did its work, presented a, um, a report. And so far, the commission hasn't taken any specific action on that report. Um, I guess the way I could best describe it is there's probably a difference of opinion um, <laughs> in what that report recommended versus where I think our commission may want to go. Mostly, <coughs> mostly based on the facility recommendations. Um, the, the part that I think everybody's in agreement with is there's some uh, pretty strong recommendations about um, making the experience at the end of the Oregon Trail more what I would call self-guided interpretation, which means you don't have to have somebody that's a paid staff person or a volunteer um, take you on a tour or pay admission to go into a museum or a facility. That might still be part of the experience, but, but self-guided would be what you think of with, when you think of a lot of the, the, the monuments in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. the, veterans, the Veterans Wall and things that you can just walk up to and you can have your experience on your own or you can talk to a park ranger who can tell you the story if you want. Um, that part, I think, is something that people are in agreement about is that that needs to be a part of the end of the Oregon Trail experience. And we've actually, I pretty, I'm pretty sure I informed you um, that there's a grant in application that's been put in by um, the Historic Oregon City Group, which is the volunteer groups is kind of keeping things going a little bit there right now uh, for some increased education and interpretation. And part of that is um, to enhance that, that um, self-guided experience where, for example, you could come to the end of the Oregon Trail site and right now, uh, the only thing that's open is the Visitor Center. The Visitor's Information Center is funded through tourism dollars by the county and the state. It's not specifically the end of the Oregon Trail experience. It just happens to be on that site. But they are offering some minimal, as much as they can, uh, end of the Oregon Trail experiences. But, for example, it wouldn't be reliant on staff where you could maybe with a... Um, a, you know, a smartphone or an iPad or something like that, or even you could check something out for five bucks from the visitors center if you didn't have your own thing, and there would be a program that connects you to something that you can do a little self-guided tour, and it would talk about the end of the Oregon Trail, or you know, you could kind of walk around the site, and there's the actual monument that says this is where Congress says is the actual end of the Oregon Trail, which is right on that site there. Um, some of those kinds of things, or maybe some paper leaflets or something that you would pick up if you didn't if you weren't as tech savvy or what have you so that part there seems to be some agreement the part where I think there's some struggle about making um, having a consensus the report basically says take down take down the old buildings and the hoops and I don't think our commission is supportive of that so we've got a report that says to do that but right now the current commission I don't think wants to do that but there is some consensus around this. Well, we'll figure this thing out, but let's at least figure out what we can, you know, agree on, which is I think this this self-guided experience and doing more of those types of things. So that's probably what a lot of this discussion will be <coughs> will be focused on. So, is there anyone in the group? Oh, sorry. Don, that's all right. Um, yeah, there is. I'm here. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So. Besides those two, kind of, um, how do you explain that? Is there any idea of, of even repositioning the property, meaning not moving it, but you know, as a, as a rec, I mean, as an event venue, where, yeah. you know, to, because it, yeah. my my background is theme parks and water parks, and 
you, you got to have a pretty strong marketing effort if you're going to pack the place. Um, and most of the time, th those events that are the, those parks that are the most successful are paired up with some other activity where the people right. will actually kind of got a peripheral view or right. they just came to the property for some other reason and now they've got an interest in coming mm -hmm. back with their family and doing this again. Um, that's one question I have, and then I have another one after that. That, that one's easy. Yes, uh, that's been discussed. That's part of the. Uh, I'll send. I'll send everybody just as you may already have it, but I'll digitally send it to you for those that don't have it. The the, the final report. Um, mostly, what that report talks about in terms of an events venue is is like a an amphitheater type of a situation. Um, there's been some discussion with some folks that I've actually had about having an event center that would bring in major acts, not mm -hmm. not the little concerts in the park where we get the community band, but we're, where we get national acts coming in um, and having, you know, a major thing. Festivals. Um, things like that, yeah. So yeah. that's part of, that. exactly what you just said is part <coughs> of the recommendation. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll send that to you and I'll let you read into that a little bit more and then we, could, we probably could dialogue more about that. So that's... Thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I learned by lots of repetition, so apologize if you've already said no, this to me. I think it's um, good to keep talking about things anyway, even if we've talked a little bit about them, just to keep them fresh. So is there a short-term solution to, to those hoops, are the rusted hoops and the net that's gone, I mean the top that was on it is gone, and it, it, it it's an eyesore. I mean, it, is there any kind of conversation about what to do with that during the interim, or? There's... There's conversation, but n not any good solution. Yeah. Um, that's that's the big issue. Yeah, is um, what do we do with that? That that's going to be, you know, I, I, again, I think I would suggest if you're a if you're just interested in this, definitely come to the discussion when it happens. And B, um, I'd suggest that pra since Ted was your representative for this topic, and since it's going to be bubbling back up again here, you probably want to appoint a representative. I'm very interested. <laughs> or, so or not just by somebody myself, needs so. to keep tabs on it for you as as a group. Don is volunteering. Is anybody else? All right. We should probably have an alternate in case. Well, I would love to be a part of the conversations down there too. Cool. I'm very fascinated with that whole what's mm -hmm. going to happen with it, and so I'd love to help. Well, tag okay. along. Okay. Please. So is everybody okay with Don as our official representative and Patrick as our alternate? Yep. Okay. Done. Anything else on that in particular or the goals in general? Okay, we'll move on to any, is there any, anybody have any other general business? <coughs> okay, cruising along, PRAC member reports. Patrick, anything? Uh, no, no sir, nothing, nothing to report for me. Okay. <laughs> nothing from me today? Uh, there's a... Uh, community open house Monday for Oregon City Transportation System plan, which I think that was that's why I got this email. Did everybody get that email? Yeah. Um, I plan to go. Are you the representative to that committee? For I the thought group that's on? yeah, that's yeah. kind of what I was yeah. dancing around. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually gonna kind of check back in with you about that since the meeting it's been several months since the that we appointed somebody to do that mm -hmm. and uh, it took him a while to get to this point of scheduling the meeting so that's I'm glad to know that that's trickling back out to you at least and mm -hmm. Wait, one more time what was the meeting it's the officially the Oregon City Transportation System Plan open house uh, it says the open house will introduce the purpose, process, and intended outcomes of the Oregon City Transportation System plan, update, and provide an opportunity for the public to provide feedback on work completed thus far. Um, let's what that is for, and just a refresher if you don't know, that, that it's commonly referred to as the TSP. You'll hear that a lot in, in planning and so forth. Is the city is required to maintain an adopted transportation system plan for um, motorized and non-motorized transportation and every so many years I don't know what the it's a it's a planning department kind of a thing so I'm not speaking at this from a technical point of view but every so many years I don't know if it's 10 or something like that they have to update that or keep it keep it updated so 
we'll be going through the, um, I guess, the update of that. And there is a major element of non-motorized transportation, which gets into bike lanes, um, mm -hmm. trails, pathways, things like that. And they asked for there's a <clears throat> there's a like a citizens committee arm of this. It's a very big, very uh, uh, a lot of public input and a lot of public process. So there's a there's a technical committee which Denise and I are on. That's kind of the staff part of it. And then there's a input. Uh, what what is it called? I don't, do, do you recall what? What it's called when you receive the uh, you're, anyway you're kind of on the citizens input com committee branch of it that's not the right oh, steering well. committee of some type I can't recall what the what they're calling it exactly so so there's kind of a couple of different advisory committees to that and uh, strong interest and in, they specifically asked for they being our, our community development planning department for a PRAC representative on that part of the committee cool. as well as a number of other key individuals or groups are being represented on that that community input um, part of the process so it's it's an important it's an important thing that, yeah. thank you guys um, just briefly, I got to go last week to a kickoff of the March for Meals. Uh, it's a promotion fundraiser for uh, the Meals on Wheels program. Um, and essentially, it was a Chamber of Commerce event where they tried to get people to take um, collection containers so people could give their change and their dollars. Um, and it's in both Oregon City and West Lynn because we do deliver the Meals on Wheels to two West Lynn routes as well. So um, <clears throat> that's just something that's happening. And a lot of that, uh, we, it also recognized the people who have um, personally uh, donated money to help support the transportation costs because there's no reimbursement for those who deliver meals on wheels you you drive your own car and you don't get reimbursed um, so this has been a way of sort of subsidizing that program we've had some community members so they got certificates so it was kind of nice I'm just uh, it'll take a while to get up to speed on all these issues I, so far I find them very interesting and uh, I have a lot to learn. Look forward to uh, getting up to speed. Interested in your comments, Don, about the rusty, whatever you call those things, down at the end of the Oregon Trail. And I was thinking as you were talking, the choices seem to be two, either fix it up or knock it down. But there must be more to it than that. And I'm sure that that would uh, not be very agreeable to to most people, but I think it's a pretty major issue. What do we do with that? That uh, end of the Oregon Trail it hasn't been there all that long, as I remember, fifteen, twenty years maybe. Yeah, but no, and it's kind of a gateway. Um, that's a pretty major thoroughfare, and with the improvements over there, there's even I imagine there's going to be a lot more traffic coming through there. And a lot of people come from out of the area to go to Home Depot, and then they wander past yeah. that, and it's yeah. pretty hard to figure out what's going on there right now. I've gone to the one over in <coughs> Baker City, and that's very, very nice. I'm sure a lot of you have been over there too to see the western movement. Uh, so I think there's a lot of potential, but I'm sure there's a lot of a lot of cost involved to get it really, really going right. Okay. And I don't see why we can't sell those pocket parks. <laughs> <laughs> you want to buy one? <laughs> <laughs> we're we're a willing seller. I think we're yeah. short on buyers. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. We'll move on to staff reports. Back okay. to you, Scott. Yeah. Um, the uh, Kanema Park project uh, is rapidly coming to a point of completion. We're kind of in the process of having the final uh, walkthroughs with the contractor to say this this is okay, but this needs to be fixed or whatever the, the punch list items. And um, tentatively, what we're targeting for a um, 
a date to actually let the park be open to the public is April 1st. And that's going to be a little bit weather dependent on, um, you know, w w the big issue, the, the biggest issue is um, making sure that our, our grass is uh, well rooted and, and won't get uh, destroyed as soon as we let people walk on it. So it's got to have, it's got to be pretty, uh, yeah, it's got to be pretty well, pretty well rooted and, and it, it should be by April 1. And then there's just a few little uh, finishing things, and then we got to put the playground chips in and uh, kind of throw the doors open, if you will, take down the fences and kick open the restroom and, and that kind of thing. Um, we are planning a uh, – the, the park will be well opened before we do any kind of a formal celebration. That will be kind of after the fact. We're planning a community celebration or a ribbon cutting uh, that will take place sometime, probably late spring to early summer. We're actually going to partner with Metro. Uh, they they actually have some um, PR and planning types of staff in their parks division that we don't have, and they're willing to help us put this event together. But they've got a major interest because of the adjacent property there, and they've done some they've done some new things with the um, Kanema Bluffs property that are tying into our Kanema neighborhood park, and the two go together. And we've been partners on these on these projects, so. So the two of us, Metro and the city, are going to put together a grand opening deal. And, of course, as that progresses and as we pin down a date, we'll let you know. And we'd love to have as many of you come to that once we get it pegged as, as we can. <clears throat> um, the Armertinger House uh, update is, uh, I think we had told you before, that we're in the process of, of selecting a, uh, an architect and engineer group to actually do the, the restoration plans. Mm -hmm. um, We've now done that, and uh, we've we've got uh, under contract. It's ARG, correct? Yeah, the firm is called ARG, and they do uh, they're um, uh, well experienced in historical building restoration, and their work is already underway. They're they're doing a lot of their preliminary work, and then they'll move into their design. And well, basically, when we're done uh, at the conclusion of their work, we'll have full uh, preservation construction plans. That was that's our goal for that part of the the work, and um, our efforts continue to to raise funds through some grants um, and some other uh, avenues uh, to to completely preserve and restore the house. Um, we've got a the biggest grant we have out there that we're waiting for word on is the community development block grants, which is administered through the county. Uh, probably we'll know for certain in April. Um, I would say there's a good chance we're going to have some funding coming in from that. We've got some other funding that we've already put together, so work continues on that. And you can have some recreation information. And then Denise is going to give you an update on recreation happenings. So I apologize my voice gives out. <coughs> um, we did have our daddy-daughter dinner dance a couple weeks ago. We were full. Give us a report that are 
3D and do folks. Um, we used to do them on Facebook, at least I remember those. <laughs> and the spring closure for the Pioneer Center, we do a spring cleaning every year. It's a one week process where we do some of our heavy lifting and a lot of our deep cleaning. That's going to be March 26th through the 30th. So we will be closed. We also will be um, asking people to stay home during the car catastrophe. Um, we'll be doing some, we won't be doing any meals on that Friday, but we will be um, stopping our meals on wheels um, people so that we're not out on the roads trying to get to them. So we're making some adjustments to that factor. Um, other than that, has anybody not heard about the car? Does everybody know what that is? The the closure of 213 at, at Park Place for four days. Um, our, our public works department and our, our um, project team, I think, have done a great job because that is out in the community everywhere already. And um, I don't have the dates right in front of me, but it's on our website. Yep, it's a Friday through a Monday, and it's going to be completely closed just to do a, what they call a rapid bridge construction. Instead of doing a bridge construction over the course of what it would have been almost a year, where you'd had to close lanes partially at a time, sort of like rip the Band-Aid off real quick and just do it all at once. And um, so, if you weren't familiar with that, so a lot of a lot of people individually and a lot of, of agencies and businesses are making plans around that that closure date. So. Um, just the, the last couple of quick things on the staff stuff. Um, I briefly mentioned, but I want to make sure I didn't um, uh, forget to point out that so the uh, the restroom concessions uh, building at Wesley Lynn, uh, which was, is being done by has been mostly done by the Oregon City High School group, is is just about done and it's going to be open for the spring and summer baseball seasons up there at Wesley Lynn and it is a fantastic building. It's the nicest bathroom that I've seen <laughs> in a park before. It's nice. it's the Taj Mahal of bathrooms. Nice. They have done a phenomenal job. And then there, there's the <coughs> concession stand there, which will be really nice to serve the folks that use the baseball fields. And it's it's a great another great addition. If you've seen the the picnic shelter structure, it's in the same architectural style and same types of materials. And that picnic shelter, I think, is the nice one, nicest picnic shelter in the Portland area. And now I think we have one of the nicest park bathrooms, thanks to our high school group. And then uh, speaking of the high school group, they're also doing as, so that was kind of the last year's project and it sort of carried into this year that we're just putting the finishing touches on. But their project that they did this year was to, um, they're putting new dugouts or you know, dugouts period, because there weren't any to exist at all, uh, both at, at Wesley Lynn and also at Chapin Park on the ball fields. And those are going to go in, and they're actually going in as we speak and will be up by the baseball season. And that's a great addition. So, again, that, that Oregon City High School construction group has been phenomenal. And we keep trying to put them up for awards and give them all kinds of recognition, but we just can't give them enough recognition. Um, and then I guess this is kind of for the new members, and it's also probably just as, as a reminder for existing members. Um, that um, f for the new members that if you have um, specific issues or topics that you're interested in, um, there are places on the agenda or you, you know it's, you can you can kind of just speak up or you can even communicate with me directly or with with Mike the chair directly. If there's something specific you'd like to put on an agenda and discuss, um, by all means communicate that under the the PRAC member reports or the other general business or whatever or in advance of a meeting if it's something that we'll need to be prepared to talk about and have a little bit of information but um, uh, this is a it, it's this this the Parks and Rec Committee is 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 here to um, to be advisory to staff and to the City Commission and your you are the eyes and ears of the community for Parks and Rec issues so if there are things going on that we should be aware of or that you're interested in talking about and that's why we have a wide range of different folks on the committee so <coughs> by all means you know just as a reminder don't hesitate to to bring up your issues to talk about and then um, our job as staff is to support you in your efforts to to do what you're doing um, if there are specific things that you need as far as information 
um, just answering questions, of course, whatever. Um, if you need some kind of documents that are out there, that, you know, or, or whatever the case may be, um, we're here to help you out. So you can always contact us. The the updated um, Parks and Rec Committee roster that I sent you in your email, um, and I, I can make you hard copies of that as well if you need that. But uh, that that has staff contact info on that if you ever need that. It has my email, has my mobile phone, has Denise's info. She's always at the ready to help as well if I'm not available. Um, and also I want to mention that uh, uh, the mobile phone on there, if you ever had uh, something come up, the last minute for the meeting and you can't reach me in my office you can always catch me on that number so anyway that's just kind of a generic reminder for everybody that if there's information you need uh, don't ever hesitate to let us know we're here to to help you uh, do what you're doing so and uh, I guess that's it thanks very good anything else from anyone Okay, our next meeting date is March 22nd, and that's the, that's the night of catastrophe, yeah. isn't it? Isn't it like 8 o'clock that night or something? The night before. Catastrophe Thursday night. Eve. Yeah. 8 o'clock um, they close it that Eve. night. So next Actually, meeting, March 22nd, and uh, we'll adjourn can, at you, Mike, can I, before you, what? before you hammer the gavel, just, um, is that, that is the night of, Eat that night. I don't think that, I, I think it's probably going to be okay. I don't know that we need to. If, Does I don't anybody know if have can, to go that way home? Yeah, that, before I just wanted to kind of see if there. Well, we can. Probably you so. can. I can get. I can. <laughs> yeah, I can excuse Denise. But does anybody else have an issue that night? Do you think with coming from the directions that you're coming from? I mean, it's going to be mostly the down the hill traffic. If you're this way or south, then you're probably going to be okay. But just wanted to make sure we were probably good with that before we. Okay. Okay, thanks. March 22nd, so we'll adjourn at 8.35. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.